Prelude to a Life It's funny how life is. You're born, you live, you die. And somewhere in between you do what you've got to do. I became a musician, probably because I have a good ear and perhaps a little talent, but mostly because we needed to eat. I was born in 1919. My father had died in the flu epidemic of 1917 and 18, so I arrived into the world without a father. My mother remarried a man who has become the only father I ever knew. Abe Lerner was a sheet metal worker and made a handsome living building stills for the gangsters and bootleggers in Cleveland. I never knew as a kid that my dad made stills for booze. I was told that they were for making buttermilk, so I couldn't inadvertently get my dad into trouble. <laughs> During Prohibition, Cleveland was a wide open town, much like Chicago. Our shop had a long driveway, and from the back of the shop, dad would load the stills onto the gangsters' trucks, camouflaging them with burlap and crates so it resembled a produce truck. As soon as the boss man would pay my dad, my father would surreptitiously stuff the money into the pockets of my pants and send me scurrying home. I would go flying down the street as fast as I could to my mother with seven or eight hundred dollars at a time. Dad knew no one who would suspect a seven-year-old kid of taking money for illegal merchandise. On several occasions, when the trucks pulled out of our driveway and into the street, there was a long barrage of gunfire from the Tommy guns of rival gangsters. In a matter of minutes, the street would be strewn with dead bodies, and sewers would literally run red with their blood. Then, as if choreographed, the cops would arrive, bang dents into the stills with their hammers for everyone to see, confiscate and impound the stills, and pick up the bodies in that order. So it was all so crazy like a Max Sennett comedy, only it wasn't funny. A few days later, my parents and I would pay our respects to our former customers at various funeral parlors. The bodies were lying in coffins, the bullet holes in their faces stuffed with putty, and the coffins surrounded by floral tributes sent by their assassins. Calling these years the Roaring Twenties was quite an understatement. About a week later, my mother and Lieutenant Clemens from the Roaring Third Precinct would do their little act. Clemens would saunter into our shop and casually tell my mom, the stuff is in the yard. Mom would hand him some money, and Dad would pound the dents out of the stills and sell them again to the next gang. One day, the feds posing as bootleggers, new in the business, came into the shop and asked my dad how to make mash, which is the basis for booze. Not suspecting a trap, he told him, and before he finished, he was arrested, handcuffed, and taken down to the station house. I don't know what happened there except that he paid a fine and was out of business. From then on, everything was downhill. Merchant Savings Bank collapsed, and what few dollars we had in savings evaporated, and we were flat broke. My first foray into showbiz was when I was five years old. My friend Dave Ennis and I stood on top of the tables in the swinging door saloon and sang All Alone by the Telephone. The patrons were kind enough to throw coins on the table. When I was six or seven, my mother bought a piano for my sister, Faye, but she had no interest in music whatsoever. This cleared the way for me to take piano lessons. I went to a convent next to St. Anne's Hospital, where I was born, to study with Sister Maria Conchetta. As soon as I had to play with both hands, I quit. I thought it was just too hard. My mother took me to see shows at the Palace Theater, and one time Bill Robinson was performing. I was hooked. Suddenly I wanted to be a hoofer, so I took dancing lessons from Roy Lewis, who taught many of the stars of the day. Pretty soon I was winning prizes and trophies and amateur night contests. I had dreams of tapping my way to stardom. Jenny, my mother, always loved music and I had a good ear. During the depths of the Depression, when we didn't know where our next meal would come from, Mom always scraped up money for my lessons and my tap shoes. She never asked me to forego a lesson or my practice to get a job and help out. 
She even saved a few pennies so we could stop and have a hot fudge sundae at Huffman's Ice Cream Parlor. Those were special days and special times. I've always suffered from spilkes, which in Yiddish is for ants in your pants. I had then, as I do now, a great tendency to be restless. I like to be moving, doing, thinking, planning. I've never been content to just sit around. This trait did not necessarily serve me well during my school years. I was bored most of the time in classes and never exhibited a bit of patience with kids who took longer to grasp the lessons. Instead of sitting quietly, I would clown around and act up and eventually end up in the principal's office. My older brother, Harold Ace Lerner, as he was known, was a drummer. When I was 13, he gave me a set of drums and got me started on the basics. I took off from there. By the time I was 15, I had my first paying job working with a trio in a local house of ill repute. I got the tidy sum of $1.50 a night. What a thrill to take the money I'd earned home to my mom. I was finally contributing something, and little did I know these were the humble beginnings of my career in music. I'll never forget the saxophone player's father came in the front door. His mouth fell open. His face turned scarlet, but it was too late to turn and run. One of life's embarrassing moments for everyone concerned. (laughs) To make matters worse, his father tried to stammer his way out of the predicament by saying that he had an appointment but went to the wrong address. One freezing night in Cleveland, it dawned on me that the piano player only had to put on his coat and gloves and then split. I had drums to pack up and lug home on the trolley. I knew then it was time to go back to the piano. I began my piano studies in earnest with my cousin and soon after was playing joints in Cleveland. My first job was at Shadowland, where the entertainment consisted of waitresses who doubled as strippers and my trio. Piano, sax, and drums. Our hours were 9 to 2.30 in the morning, and we played for a princely sum of 15 bucks a week. I learned to play jazz by listening to Earl Hines' records. I also learned that if I turned off the motor of my Model A Ford in coast down Carnegie Avenue, I could get to work and back on 10 cents worth of gas. One night after work, a local bass player asked me to go with him to a little joint on Cedar Avenue, the Harlem of Cleveland. Val's in the alley was like no other gin mill with music. I had never been there. There was a single light bulb dangling from a pipe that barely illuminated the door. Customers walked up a little stoop and into the darkest and smokiest joint in Cleveland. Sitting in the corner was an old, and I do mean old, beat-up upright piano with nobody playing it. There were only a few people sitting around at that hour in the morning, so my So-called friend said, Al, why don't you go over and play a couple of tunes? Cocky kid that I was, I said to myself, why not? And strode over to the piano, sat down, and with all the sophistication of a 17-year-old, played Rosetta in my best Earl Hines imitation. I followed with a couple of other tunes, then feeling pretty smug with a smirk on my face, I returned to the table to finish my beer. I even had the gall to look around the room to see if anyone had heard me, as only the young and uninitiated are brazen enough to do. It was then that I noticed a hulk of a man standing by the small, homemade makeshift bar, looking up at the ceiling and drinking beer. Quietly and deliberately, he walked over to the piano, set down his beer, and struck a chord. That's all I had to hear to know that I was dead. That chord was like nothing I had ever heard before. It made the hair stand up in the back of my neck. Then he played T for two like I'd never heard it played before. Humiliated, I ran out of the club and down the alley crying like a baby. Red, the bass player, ran after me and apologized for setting me up and asked me to come back into the club because the piano man who had just 
blown me away, wanted to meet me. Mustering up every bit of courage I could, I returned to meet Art Tatum. Kid, I like your style, he said. Come here as often as you can and sit in. My heart leaped into my mouth, and I struggled to whisper thanks. This was to become the beginning of a great friendship that lasted the rest of his life. If I, Art and I were in the same town at the same time, I moved heaven and earth to see him. Pianistically, he was God. The last time I saw Art was at the Swing Club in Hollywood. Frankie Lane, his wife Nan, Ruth, my late wife, and I were there to celebrate our wedding anniversaries, which fell on the same day. Art told us two side men to take five and played alone for the rest of the night. Anyone who's heard Art recognize it as a rare privilege and a feast for the ears and soul. Little did I know that this would be one of the last times I would see him. He died shortly after at the age of 56, but left a big hole in my heart and an even bigger one as a musical legacy. Our Tatum was truly a musical jazz genius. He was without peer. What made his jazz so outstanding probably was due to the fact that he studied classical piano for 13 years. Every pianist in the field of modern piano artistry can thank R. Tatum for evoking creativity to every one of us. We only wish we could play half as good as he did. To this day, no pianist has approached what art could create at the moment. When I sit down and play, sometimes I come up with something new and fresh off the top of my head, and I wonder if art would let out a yeah. <laughs> Sadly, my friend, my inspiration, my mentor, died of kidney failure. I could not cry. It hurt so bad. By the time I was 17 years old, I was working in joints around Cleveland for 15 bucks a week. That was a lot of money in 1937. I was gaining some notoriety as a local jazz musician, earning the respect of my peers. During a visit with relatives in Detroit, I heard a band out of Texas led by Ben Young, Gordon Tex Beneke, Claude Lakey, and Dalton Rosati were members of the band, and we struck up a friendship. A few weeks later, when they were playing in Cleveland, they stopped by Shatterland to see me. Claude and Dalton were on their way to New York to join the newly organized Harry James Band. About a year later, the James Band came to the Trianon Ballroom in Cleveland with a new singer by the name of Frank Sinatra. Wow, was he something! He was fresh and exciting and brought a whole new approach to singing with a band. The next time I saw the James Band was when they came to town to play for prom night at the Cleveland Hotel. The boy singer was Dick Hames, who had replaced Sinatra. My old friend Claude Lakey invited me to come and hear the band and their new singer. Claude asked Harry if I could sit in because he wanted Harry to hear me play. I played the set with the band, and as soon as I finished, Harry asked me if I would like to join the band. I could hardly control myself. I was so excited, but I managed to blurt out, when? Tonight, said Harry. I immediately backed off because I didn't want to leave my girl. So I told Harry I couldn't join him at that time. Shortly after Harry James left town, I was offered an engagement in Florida with a fine singer named Kirk Wood, who sang with many bands of the 40s, Alvino Ray, Little Jack Little, and more. Kirk and I took off with a boyhood friend, Irv Metzenbaum, brother of Howard, who would go on to become one of the most powerful senators in Washington, and my good buddy, Vic Corpora in Irv's 1938 Pontiac. Vic was a wonderful drummer and lyricist that wrote the lyrics to my music, So Until I See You, which was chosen by Jack Parr to be the closing theme for his Tonight Show. On the way down, we stopped in St. Augustine, Florida, so I could visit Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth and purchase a bottle of water for my girlfriend, Ruth, 
who was all of 17 years old and hardly in need of a youth elixir. Then on to Miami, we arrived there. We had to find a place to stay. We started looking around Miami Beach, but quickly found out we couldn't afford to stay there. So we began to look around Miami proper for a rooming house and found one we could afford. The $2.50 rate for two in a room was well within our means. Planted firmly on the front lawn was a sign that proclaimed for everyone to see, no dogs or Jews. We had so little money that I had to overlook the bigotry. We rented the room. I wonder if they ever knew a, a Jew slept in their precious bed. We found a place to eat a seven-course meal for 35 cents. We had it made, or at least we thought so. We reported for work only to find that the job had fallen through, so we decided to go to Havana. Why? Because we'd never been there. Kirk found work singing in a local club and decided to stay behind. The trip to Havana on the good ship, the Cuba, was a nightmare. The ship tossed and turned in the rough seas all night long, and we spent the time heaving over the railing, wishing we were dead. The next morning, 12 of the 200 passengers showed up in the dining room, but only four ate breakfast. How did I know this? I was one of the four who, along with Irv, ate that morning. We landed in Havana and set ourselves up in a cheap hotel. We had no money for booze or food, so we visited the local rum distilleries, tossing down the free samples offered to tourists in the hopes that they would purchase the rum and take it back to the States in their luggage. We heard about a famous bar in Havana called Sloppy Joe's. It was crummy looking, dank and dreary, and filled with tourists who, like us, wondered why had they gone out of their way to visit it. Soon our Cuban holiday was over, we headed back to Miami on the Cuba, this time with the contents of our stomachs intact. Landing in Miami, I called my mother, who told me there had been several calls from someone named Jimmy Harry. Do you mean Harry James? I asked, and she said, yes, that's it. My heart leaped. It was pretty exciting to think someone as famous as Harry James wanted to talk to me. Jumping into the Pontiac, we drove straight home, stopping only for gas. Food was out of the question. We were too broke to eat. I was in love with Ruth, the recipient of the Fountain of Youth Water. And I wanted to see how she felt about me before I made a decision about going to New York to join the James Band. So in a friend's borrowed car, I took Ruth for a drive, and summoning all my courage, I said, Ruth, what's the score? Not knowing what I was trying to ask her, she said, I know the Indians play today, but I don't know the score. I clarified my position, and she said, Well, I don't think so. I now knew where I stood and decided right then and there to call Harry and join the band. In fact, I did just that. I left the next day for New York and the beginning of my lifelong career in music.